TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch, we are not live. Particularly with like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. This is Ben Pars Pearsons. Pearsons? Pearson. The pursuit that haunts me. Retired police interceptor, man. Don't forget we are partnered with the Blueprint Mastermind. The link to this is down in the description. Uh, this is the latest episode of the Roundtable Discussions. You know what I'm saying? Um, don't, don't forget, if you're looking for any of my old stuff that made the channel, is what it is today. Just, you know, it's on Facebook. Take a look at it. All of it will be back next month. So, And don't forget, we are um, on Patreon. This is a list of everything that's on Patreon. This is England as well. And uh, one more is starting soon as well. And we do got the Discord. Don't forget about the Discord. That's down in the link below too. Let's get into this. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. The case that haunts. So about 2012, we worked out of Tolalem Police Station at Top End. All right. Here we go. Just in case. So I see you put a little warning. Me too. In Bradford. Uh, he worked out of Tolalane Police Station at the top end of Bradford. A uh, great place to work. It's where, literally, as soon as you come out of the doors or drove your police car out of the gates, you dropped on it. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. You, you, you couldn't get more than 50 metres without either issuing a ticket, dropping on a crime, dropping on a criminal, or pursuing a car. It was just rife. Everywhere you went, it was rife. They used to drive past station trying to mock us and go us into doing things. Um, and at that time, the essence of being a traffic cop were brilliant. They were, it's like at the time, you were given money at that time, you were given vehicles. So we're all driving around in Vectras, VXR. So there were 2.8 twin turbo Vectras. There were rocket machines on wheels, so were uber quick cars. Um, and the team that we worked with, Team 2 at Bradford, were fantastic. And it had all these lads that were massively like pursuit specialists. Some team you might have three lads on it, and that, and some that are good at RTCs, and some that are good. All this team that we had were brilliant at pursuing cars. You, you, you were with the best of the best at the time. And I remember a job coming out, and I, I paid no attention to this job at all um, when it first came out. And it were a, a fact of there were someone going out doing carjackings and doing robberies, and it was one of those things where does it fall under my remit? No, it's a crime. It falls under CID. We're not there to deal with that. We're there to deal with the, the pursuits, the RTCs, uh, so on and so forth. It got to a point when the suspect was known to be driving in a Subaru. And hmm, shout out to the first responders. I forgot to mention y'all, man. Y'all keep it pushing every time, man. Love y'all, man. Appreciate the likes y'all leaving the, in the uh, premieres. And if you haven't checked out the vlog I did yesterday with my baby mama, it's up there somewhere. And then the suspect was known to be driving in a Subaru and then goading the traffic cops. And I remember hearing on radio, there were a traffic cop called Warren and he'd seen the Subaru up by hospital in Bradford. And the Subaru was just, literally, as soon as he saw it, he clapped eyes on it, the Subaru made off. Um, there was no way he could go near it or get near it because the, the, the way it were driven were just too dangerous. There were things that... You're probably looking 80, 90 mile an hour through the middle of traffic when kids are leaving school, wrong side of the road, where you just wouldn't be able to pursue it. And he went off-road, he did everything he could to try and get away from these bobbies. This lad, who was being pursued at the time, was um, an amateur show professional, that sort of like level, a uh, boxer, I think about 20, 21, but it was stocky, or built, and he wasn't someone to be messed with lightly, if that makes sense. He were, he were good in us, and he wanted to uh, see how good he was, basically. That's that's what it was about. And anyone that drives a Subaru thinks he can drive fast, just in a straight line. But you've got to realise that there's a certain point when that car says, it's all about me now, it's not about the driver. And it's all about what I am going to do. And if I don't like it, if I'm not going to be happy on this road, I'm going to tell you. And um, this car made off from two beat bobbies about three hours before, and it were in the area, we knew it were in the area. This lad, the crimes that he'd been doing, he'd been pulling women out of cars and 
literally attacking them, taking the cars, robbing them of the bags. It was violent beyond belief. So he was really, really living GTA out in the UK. That's tough. This lad was what we would say were massively dangerous. We're on patrol in Bradford and it were about three in the morning. And Ben is a great teller of stories. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, I'll be fully of tentative. Watch him. I thought, I'm gonna stay out for a little bit longer just to see what's out about. And I knew the lads at the time had all just gone in. I think it'd been a busy day. I'm sure that we had a potential fatal beforehand and had swept up from that and be dealing with that. And then I went back to Nick. So I think I were only one out and about. And I decided to go back to work, but go down Manning Lane, turn right up Hamstrass and turn right up Westgate and go back to Nick right away. Nothing on radio, silence, um, warm night at the time. Uh, and it was just that feeling in the air that Sometimes when you go into something or you're, you're dealing with something, sometimes it's a tangible feeling. I know it sounds stupid. It's like when you go to a football match or a concert and you can feel the buzz outside the stadium before you're going in. You know something's going to be going on. Everyone's on this sort of like level. You could feel it in air. I remember driving up to the junction of Hamstrass and Westgate um, and I just pulled up in car. And just as I come to a stop in traffic car, I could just hear this the sound of the Subaru. That's coming towards the junction. Playing with you. We knew you was there. And it just edged from edge of a building. It just came. You saw its nose bu- 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 coming out. And then as soon as it got into eye view, the driver had a visor down. Um, so you, you couldn't see his face, but I could see from bottom part of his face, Asian lad, about 20 years old. It's all looking at car. Hmm. Was it thirty? Thirty drivers? Thirty? Sometimes, because you're a bit tired, I could see it number play, but it wasn't registering in my head. And then I could see him look down. And he, as soon as he looked down, his eyes got me and focused on me. My eyes focused on him and switch went instantly. And I thought, fucking hell, it's him. It's it's that car, it's that stolen car, and it's him. Um, there were, it was like a, a, a standoff, a Mexican standoff. Who was going to draw a gun first? I was looking at his car. He, you could see he was looking at my... I mean, if, I think if he thought, well, could I outrun this lad? What's going to be going on? And I started revving car, get revs up a little bit for... Because I know what's going to go on here, he's going to go. I actually thought he was going to just go straight on through the junction because he'd have got a better run-up then and he'd been off, but he didn't. He anchored left and he just floored it. He just went, and he, he were off. And he turned left down Westcott. Instantly, my heart sank because I knew we're on for a pursuit. This is going to be a fast pursuit, is this? This isn't going to be something um, that's going to be two less in the right in a D camp. This is going to be a balls out pursuit, is this? Swung car around. And you, whenever a pursuit takes place, you have a, an instant bolt of adrenaline. This adrenaline goes straight up, but then it, it comes back down and plateaus because you tra- you're so highly trained to do one thing. Um, it's all you focus on. You don't get tunnel vision, you don't get red mist. It's like you've just plateaued in your car. It all sort of like switches on all at once. Um, in the second gear, lights go on, straight onto comms. I can't remember what it was, X-ray Romeo 5-2 urgent, vehicle failing to stop, it's the vehicle used in the robbery. Uh, everyone knew about it, comms knew about it, F's up knew about it. And I think by that time, everyone's bailing out at Nick and they're all obviously wanting to get on this pursuit, get this lad stopped. By time, I set off down Hamstrasse, the car itself, the power of the car, the back end sank down, the engine revved so hard, and I shot down Hamstrasse with him. And I locked on, there was no way we were getting away, it was just a basic Subaru. It was, well, it was an Impreza, but it was just a basic, you know what I mean, there was nothing pumped up about it. And I got locked on, as we swung left onto Manningham Lane, I overshot a little bit, but I overshot it to keep it wide. So when I come out of the junction, I'm in the line of traffic coming the opposite way so they can see my lights. Because what you want to do if you're pursuing a car at that time, you, you, there's revelers about. You want to make yourself as visible as possible to pedestrians, right? There, there might be some members of the public, there might be some people just out going to curry houses that are still open at that time. So anyone that's coming out of the way, any taxis, you want them to see that you're coming towards them with lights flashing. You don't want to be blending in behind the car. Um, he had no thought for anybody else. And if I knew at that point then, what it was going to do, I'd have probably just not done it. I'd have just 
I'm making this quick video because it has been one month since joining the cash flow. Has it now? Right. You can't. I'd have probably just not done it. I'd have just probably bought it. But you can't see in future. You can't see what's what's going to be there. And I remember just going through gears at VXI and just watching revs go up, gear, third gear. And I thought, right, do I go fourth gear? I looked at fourth gear and then I looked at my speedo and I'm going past Maestro's and Centre Bradford, what used to be Maestro's, and we're over 120 mile an hour. This is 30 mile an hour limit. Roads aren't designed to be driven on at that speed. There's so many, it's different on motorway, it's different on big roads. There's so many little undulations. Your car's getting thrown left and right in road. You're losing your front wheel, it comes up a little bit. It's skipping. Your traction control's coming on at certain little times because the amount of power you're giving your car, and at that time you're having to still do your comms. Yeah, we're now left, 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 the Manning Lane. One, two, zero miles an hour speed increasing. I've still got him in my sights. And you're having to give your plan over. You're having to tell your boss or the control room, what is your plan? I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to get a helicopter, I'm going to get him boxed in. Um, you can't say, I'm just going to drive him until he crashes. It just doesn't work like that. Um, as I'm shooting through Bradford, I can see the... I wonder if you mentally know that, though. Like, man, we're going to have to drive until this bro, until bro hits something and stop himself. Like, you got to know that sometimes. Like, this dude not stopping. He ultra aggressive. He probably off, you know what I'm saying, testosterone or something. Oh. Traffic lights at Queen's Road. And they got red. No cars there. They got red. But this is a this is a, a route that taxi drivers use all the time. This is a route that trucks use all the time. Ambulances. It's, it's, it's a busy route. And as I look down, I'm increasing 120, and he's pulling away from me in the Subaru. Um, at that point... That Subaru has something. I know what's happening. It's going to end in tears. It's going to end one way, it's and it's going to end with him dying or me dying. He then swaps his car in alternates to the opposing carriageway, heading into what had come around the corner at that point. And if you look at the road, if you know the road, you can't have a visual line. You're driving blind, and you're going to drive into the oh, apex, okay. but on the wrong side, you're just going to hit something. Goes through um, traffic lights, I'd estimate 130 miles an hour plus. And all he does, when he goes through, I can see gravel get thrown up from under the car. I just shout instantly, it's going to kill someone, abort, abort, abort. And in my head, I'm done. I've pulled the, I've pulled the switch, it's, it's, it's done, it's over with, the, the pursuit is gone. Um, but because I've driven him to that, that level, even if I pull a bar until he's gone out of my sight and is safe, I'm still fully responsible for what goes on. When I, when I see the gravel of the car, I can see it lean gently at one side and then it comes up and it just goes gently to the other side and all this is in slow motion for me. I don't know how it feels for the driver, but it's in slow motion for me. I know at that time that that driver is already lost control of the car. What I'm seeing is the back end of the car and him inside must be panicking left, right, left, right. And basically when he's gone to the opposing side of the carriageway with so much weight on the, the, the back end of the car, the off side of the car, and he's going through, Basically, the car's got so low on one side, it's come up on its suspension, it's gone to the other side, and it's fishtailing now. And it's that point I just think, he's, he's dead. He's dead straight away. He, he hasn't even hit, hit, hit anything, but he, he's going to end in tears. The car, car pirouettes, just spins in road, just goes all the way around and keeps going. And it's just an almighty smash of dust. You just don't see anything but a, a, a dust ball. But when you're looking at it, you can, you can hear, even through the glass of your car, with the windows shut at over 100 mile an hour, you can hear all the metal bending and cracking. Um, I instantly shout crash, 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 but I'm 200 meters away, if not longer. And I'm having to brake hard on my car for it to come to a stop because of the amount of force I'm generating in the car. As I, Come up to the. Come up to what the, kind of car did he say he was driving? Something real fast, twin turbo like, right? Seeing the back of his car is folded up, so if you're sat in the car, you'd be instantly looking at the the bonnet. It's folded up. 
it's backwards into a wall up and through a bush shelter so it's tangled up into this mess and it's completely and utterly ripped apart it's just demolished and I thought it, he's dead he's, he's dead and as I'm looking to the side of the wall I can see a body laid on grass and I thought he's been, he's been ejected from his vehicle as soon as the cars come to a full rest I can see him climbing out of the driver's seat of the car and he climbs over this body or torso that's laid on the grass. He literally climbs over him and then he starts to run. And I'm thinking, well, someone's been ejected from the car and the driver's out or the passenger's out. My job is then is to detain that person. I know the person on the grass can go anywhere because he's laying there still. I, I, I stop the car, I open the door and I'm giving comms on my radio and I'm chasing this lad on foot. We're running through the, the woods of Lister Park and because it's dark and I can see the, the lights over in the corner, I can see his silhouette and I can hear him panting as he's breathing. But by that time, my adrenaline's now flushing. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm basically starting to go deaf because of the amount of adrenaline pumping through my body. And I can see him, but I'm running with all this kit on. Like I said, I've got, I've got combat boots on, I've got big heavy combat pants on, I've got my vest on, my tack vest. I've got all my equipment, I've got everything else all on me. And um, he just he just leaves me. He just he just goes. He's, I just can't, there's no way I can catch him. Uh, I'm completely and utterly out of breath and I'm ruined. Um, when I, when I turn back round, I can just see a load of heads huddling around this torso on the floor. Um, Why are you saying a torso? Like, is there no legs on that log or something? And I've got to sort of like get back as quickly as I can. And when I do, there's this lad laying on the floor. And he's, he's only a young lad, so about 19. Um, and from knees down, he's literally one leg's disintegrated and the other leg's completely not de gloved. All the skin's removed from the leg. It's all pulled down towards the ankle. You can just see bone and like fillet steak, it, it, meat, if that makes sense. But it's like a purpley meat because it's still active with blood. There's blood spilling everywhere. And the first person that were there to give first aid were my partner now which ironically, she didn't know it was me that were driving and I didn't know it were her. I can remember this lad screaming, just saying, help me, help me. We initially thought it was one of the suspects from the car. Um, I, uh, I spoke to the supervisor that come down when they were trying to do the first aid on this lad. And first thing you have to do is call it potential fail. He's, he's got no legs, he's, he's gonna be dying. As soon as call it as potential fatal, the, the, the duties of the police are to remove the driver of the, the pursuing car, which is me. So I don't deal with anything then. I'm literally treated as a suspect. Uh, a good suspect, if that makes sense, but I'm literally treated as the suspect. I'm thrown in the car and moved from the scene. I go back and an investigation takes place. Turns out that this lad is a 19 year old reveler who has been out for a few drinks with his friend and he's just decided to sit on the wall with his legs dangling over the edge of the wall. Just at the same time, he must sit down and he must be there five to 10 seconds. And at the same time, the Subaru comes into view backwards, comes straight past him, takes his legs off and ends up in the bus shelter outside of him. This lad's done nothing wrong. He's, he's just a completely innocent party. But if it wasn't for me pursuing that car, if it wasn't for me going and wanting to catch that offender, and I've got a way up how much, how much I want to catch somebody. Yo. Imagine going to go watch your favorite team, stepping out the bar real quick. Let me get a fresh air. Sitting on the dangling of your legs and looking down, and them are gone. That's crazy. This is the type of stuff that just make you want to stay inside. Honestly, like I don't even want to do nothing no more. You never know. How much we need to protect the members of the public. What would you feel if it were your family member that had had your car stolen and had been beat up, mugged, and you knew I were behind them in the car? What would you want me to do? How would you want me to deal with it? Would you want me to carry on with the pursuit? What happens if you were this young lad's mother or father or brother or sister or cousin? Do you want me to abort the pursuit? Where's that fine line? Now, I think I aborted at the right time, but if I could go back, I'd probably abort it before he got to the traffic lights. Would it have stopped the crash? I don't know. Would his speed have been at what it'd have been, I don't know. Um, you've got to understand the amount of pressure that you're under at the time as a driver. 
to deal with stuff the right way, do your comms the right way. You're analysing the road, the road layout, the speed of your vehicle, what the dangers are, where there's members of public, where there's any vehicles. You've got to formulate a plan in your head of where this pursuit's going and what's going to be going on with this pursuit. And is it dangerous? Well, all pursuits are going to be dangerous. There's no way about it. You can't, you can't pursue a car and it not be dangerous. But this lad that's lying up floor didn't deserve to be injured how he's injured. Um, I had then, I can't tell you how long, but I think it was months. I had months in my head of worrying, constant worrying. This lad was taken straight from the scene to emergency surgery. And I had every day I would come in straight into office, I'd wait for that phone call, he's dead. Then they'd be, would they be investigating me for dangerous driving, death by dangerous? Am I going to prison? This is how it's going to be, this is how my career ends. Um, month after month. I kind of knew that they had to go through that if they pursuing somebody and they pursue too much. And that's why they be having a layoff like that. That's why in Chicago they don't, you can't pursue a motorcycle. I don't know if the rule has changed, but you're not allowed to pursue a motorcycle on, on the E-Way. You got to just let them go. <laughs> I don't think you're allowed to pursue them at all. Huh? But I know that's one of the reasons, but I didn't know it was that deep. Like, hey, you go to jail for doing your job? I guess when you get overzealous and you you want to be a tryhard, that's how you keep people in check like that. Like, okay, I get it. All right. And it just it burned. It just got too much weight on my shoulders at time. And I remember going to see a um, an officer who we were dealing with a collision at time. And I remember, or in tears, I was crying. And I said, I need to see this lad. I need to see him. I need to beg for forgiveness. Um. He contacted the lad's mum and the lad agreed to see me, so I went to his house. And I was, I don't think I've ever been as nervous. I don't think I've ever been as scared and as resentful of something in my life. Went in through the door and I think he'd been having a cigarette at the back and he came in and he was walking, but I can't remember if he had a prosthetic leg on, I can't remember, but I just remember him, he were a mess, physically a mess, but his attitude was just brilliant. His confidence was brilliant, his forgiveness, he just, he said it wasn't my fault, he shook my hand, he says, I've got nothing to worry about, he doesn't blame the police. Um, his zest for life, well, 10 times what my zest for life was, it wasn't stopping him, he wasn't held back by anything. And you could see by his attitude and the way he was dealing with it, he was just pushing forward all the time. And he wasn't gonna let something like this set him back. The lad that we dealt with for the crime got sentenced to a long time in prison. Um, and he, uh, he went guilty and got, he got sentenced for a long time. And in my head, I've always treat the lad who was hurt as part of my police career and what I've altered and what I've altered in someone's life. And I carry that all the time. It hurts me to know that this lad has been physically, physically hurt by me coming on duty that night. If I'd have rung in sick, it'd be normal. It'd be all sorted out. Or even if you would have just clocked out when you were supposed to clock out and go your regular route. I'm just saying, because from what I heard, you know. And it were only when I wrote my book, I put a chapter in my book about this incident uh, on this lad. Now, this lad is local to where we patrol and it got back to his family that we'd wrote the book. And the book was obviously doing the rounds, so to speak, and doing, doing okay. It's then I received a, a message on Twitter from uh, his mum, outlining the fact that he's doing really well with his life. He's studied at university for his degree. He's now a father of, I think, a five-year-old child. Um, he's still got the same zest for life and his life's moving on brilliantly. His family, again, don't hold any resentment towards the police. They forgive me for everything that's happened. Um, and they said I shouldn't carry this weight on my shoulders, but you still do. You can't alternate who you are and what you do. But there's not one minute of the day goes by where I don't think about him. And that's quite, I wouldn't say that's satisfying on my part, but it's again, it's something that haunts you. So if you think about how a police brain works, you see something and you put it in a little black box, something really bad, 
So it goes in your little back box and your elevator takes it down to your basement and it puts it on your, on your shelf where it shouldn't go and it then gets locked up again and then your keys get put in another lock and then you don't bother it and eventually your black boxes fill up on these shelves. So you got a black box, you got a bunch of black boxes and a, and a bag. That's... And it gets so full that your shelf starts to overload and starts to, so being able to talk about it releases it out of that box sometimes and when it, I got the message from the parent I, I was really it was sort of like it was dealt with you know, I was happy it was dealt with so it's, it came out of that box I don't want to cause anyone any more misery or pain but yeah I think about you all the time like I think about him all the time I think about the, the crash all the time I can still hear the metal bending I can still hear the grass, glass popping you're a good person. You you go out to do a good job. You go out to be a member of the society where people can say if you if you're struggling, if you're if you're in danger, go to the police. Not if you're in danger, don't go to the police because you're gonna get hurt. Um, yeah, that's crazy. I wish a lot of the officers had the same officers had the same outlook on that job as you because that intimidation, and especially in Chicago, oh, they go out and they, <laughs> they they go out, and I feel like, this is just my opinion, they go out like, hey, they better fear me. Like, that's, it's better to be feared than loved when you're a police officer. That's how I feel like in Chicago. They, they want you to fear. I'm glad he's doing all right, and I'm glad he's forgiving me, but- Some of them, not all. They're the sort of like jobs that you've got to, but where they're the jobs you've got to make that decision make. And that's also in my personal opinion, my personal run-ins. In, in a split second, and where you're on a, a split second, that's going to ruin someone's life forever. So would I go back and do it differently? I don't know. I probably would. I'd probably have bought it sooner as a site. Um, but yeah. See a little leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post, man. You can't do I like Ben, man. Cool dude, man.